Hi and welcome back to another video. I hope you had a good week and were able to digest the huge leap in performance that we saw from the gain from 13th to 14th gen. And now one thing I want to check is, I mean currently we're assuming that 14th gen like 4900K is 99% identical to a 3900K or KS. But I always have to also check physically if that's the case, especially for example for our deliters, which we sell through Thermal Grizzly, to also check if there's full compatibility or if there might be any kind of problem. And also if there is going to be a drop in performance. So that's what we will try to find out today. Before we start deleting our 4900K, obviously we'll just take some stock values, put it back into the board and record the stock temperature as comparison value. We are testing the stock condition with a 360 AIO because I guess that's the most common scenario and uh, we will also run it at a fixed CPU speed, fixed uh, CPU vCore simply to have reliable comparison values. And to also ensure that the cooling has no impact on the performance or the results, I fixed the fan speed to close to 1200 RPM in IQ and also changed to balanced profile on the pump. Our base comparison profile is with XMP 7600. I fixed the P-cores to 5.6 GHz. Typically on a 4900K, if you run it stock without any kind of power restrictions, power limit restrictions, then you would see clocks of something between 5.3 and 5.5 in Cinebench. And so it's a slight overclock, but it would be lower than what you would see typically in gaming when the CPU runs stock. We have a fixed V-core of 1.39 volt with a load line calibration of level 5. Stock is typically level 3 or level 4. And even with level 5, there will still be quite a significant drop. So this should drop down to something around 1.25, 1.26 volt. One thing I quickly want to highlight is that if I run hardware info and like OBS in the background to record what you're seeing, there is always some kind of base load in the back now nicely peaked to like 6 or 7%, but even like real idle with hardware info and just OBS in the background, you can see there's like a base load of maybe like 4 or 5%, which is why my score is often lower as what you would see at home when I'm doing this kind of recording. In Cinebench, you can see the voltage significantly drops to like 1.23 to 4, and we see 5.6 gigahertz on the P cores, and yeah, it's going to be on the max. Like, temperature-wise, there is not more possible on this chip with this kind of voltage and, um, yeah, clock. You can see one core 97, this one 100, so that was pretty much on the limit to throttle down. It's slightly lower score than what I had in the German take. We had like 40,300, I think. Could be the typical fluctuation, but still, that's like the, the peak I can do with this kind of setup. You can also see that peak power draw was 293 watt. Can just repeat it. And then you can see what kind of like average power we usually see, but it's yeah, 290 watt. And that should be our base comparison value. And that would be the, the max. And then we will see if there's any kind of improvement possible with the deleted CPU. CPU in the deleter ready to go, already aligned to the triangle marking. And in case you're wondering, I mean, this is still my, basically my prototype I used back then, which has the same exact dimension as the retail 13th gen deleter from Grizzly, but just so you know. Went easy and quick, also feels loose. Chic, do you approve the deleting or? Mm-hmm. Quick look at the heat spreader. On the left side, we have a 13900KS, as you can see. And just quick observation, seems like no difference whatsoever, as expected. Now another quick comparison between the generations. On the total left, we have the 12900K. In the center, the 13900KS. And on the total right side, the 14900K. And as expected, if you compare the 12th to the 13th and 14th gen, we see on the left that the die is slightly smaller because from the 13th generation on, we had more e-cores but between the 13th and 14th generation, we basically can see no difference at all. I will now prepare both CPU and IHS. For that, I will have to remove the entire glue on IHS and also on the CPU. And in addition, also remove the indium from both parts. 
But then I also have to grind down the yeah, outer part of the IHS a little bit because if we get rid of the indium, which I assume is like 0.4 millimeters, something like that, it means that the IHS has to slit slightly lower to compensate that. So we also have to modify it. I now want to measure the height difference of the chip to the PCB to see if there's any kind of difference. So we have the chip already underneath here. I put the CPU into a lapping tool to have an even surface. And I already have it here, 100 times magnified, which is kind of required because I want to measure the height difference of here, which is the PCB to the chip that you can basically see right here. What we're doing basically is we have a different focus for the different layers. So in this situation right here, the chip would be in focus and in this, the PCB would be in focus. And this way we get this uh, 3D profile where we have the chip and the underfill on the side and here the PCB. And now I can add two measurement points to simply get the height difference. And there we have the height difference of chip to PCB, which is the same as what we had with the 12th and 13th gen. We measured like 0.44 millimeter with like a caliper. And yeah, this way we have 0.43 millimeter, which is basically measurement tolerance. And now I assume, or I would assume, that this area around here is a little bit higher than 0.44 millimeter than compared to the center, which we would have to grind off. So we are also checking that. So here we have the IHS, currently 20 times magnified only. So that's all the nickel-plated copper. Here we have the gold layer, and this area would be all the yeah, residues from the indium solder. And now we want to get a height profile of this area right here. So here again, we have our like 3D height profile. So we're checking again the height from here. And now we see that we have 0.3 millimeter, which is actually perfect. That also means that we don't have to adjust anything on the, on the heat spreader. Um, there is enough like tolerance that it should work just fine applying liquid metal without reworking the IHS. I already applied conductor not extreme, we'll now put the lid back on and mount everything. And to be fully honest, I'm quite skeptical because this never worked out without slightly grinding down the edge of the IHS. So yeah, only one way to find out. I performed the pre-testing without contact frame, so that's why I just mounted it exactly the same way again. It could be that it performs better without contact frame because it should put a more even, yeah, like load onto the die, but let's see. At least the uh, boot seems to be working fine. That's a good sign, so CPU seems to be alive. And at least the temperature in BIOS seems to be fine. So same profile as previously, same settings. I'm not sure, IELTS temperature seems to be fine, but could be a little bit high. I don't know, we have some cores like peaking idle like 60 degrees Celsius, could be normal, not quite sure. Core 5 and Core 7 were the hot ones with like 95 to 97, but let's check. I'm not quite sure if something is wrong or if this is really quite a bit better. It's already the second run. The first one I had 39,800. I just did for the German take, which, yeah, seemed to be in line to what we had previously. Also task manager is not doing anything sketchy in the background. So, yeah, it's like previously 5% roughly, so that seems to be okay. I will double check the footage and do a proper comparison next to next with like the first and the second run of Cinebench. So we see yeah, a good comparison for the temperature values. Can just rerun it again. But also, yeah, power consumption is also in line. It's a little bit lower, which is as expected if you delete and have lower temperature. Seems to be in line. It's for sure better. Just have to find out by how much. So I checked the maximum core temperatures after the second run. And on average, we can find a maximum peak core temperature of 93.1 degrees Celsius after the second Cinebench run. And then after the lidding, it was only 83.2 degrees Celsius on average as maximum. So that's indeed about 10 degrees Celsius colder. And also the E-cores got colder by about 8 degrees Celsius. 
Okay, so finally I also decided to check this in addition with the deleted IHS and also in combination with contact frame to see if and how well this works. The impact from using the contact frame in this case was actually smaller than I expected. We increased it further by about 2 to 3 degrees Celsius. So overall we went from like 93.1 to 80.1 degrees Celsius, which is still a very good result. It's about 13 degrees Celsius lower. To be fully honest, I was quite surprised that this actually worked because I did this so many times in the past, for example, with exactly this IHS and the 13900 KS. I used it because I was too lazy to put the EK direct die block on it at a certain point and I just wanted to use a specific CPU. So I put the lid back on with liquid metal and the temperatures were really bad. And I tried this, I mean, even with 12th gen, I did this and like 9th gen and we always had to like move away a bit of the heat spatter. You can also, I think in the ninth gen video, see this in, in some of my old content. And I expected this to fail, but it worked out for whatever reason, which is kind of surprising. And then the 13 degrees Celsius lower temperature is actually quite nice, like 12 to 13, because in this state, it's fairly easy to do. You just have to delete it, like just use a deliter and modify the CPU obviously with liquid metal, put it back in. You don't even have to necessarily use a contact frame. It will give you the last few degrees Celsius. It will depend on how badly your CPU was shaped and also on the cooler, obviously. On some coolers, it might be better. On some, it might be worse. It's, I mean, it's something that has been tested so many times. So I would say something between maybe two to six degrees Celsius is what you would usually expect as a kind of temperature improvement from the contact frame. But if this would work on all of the systems, then like you can easily use this for monobox as well because it doesn't really change the overall height of the CPU maybe by like 0 0.2, 0 0.3 millimeters, something like that, which is surely within tolerances. But yeah, I mean, I'm kind of surprised. Like I'm not sure if this will work for everyone because I only tested this with this very specific CPU right here. And maybe we can like together collect more information about this. Maybe there are some people out there who want to delete their CPU anyway, and maybe they, they can try it and even leave feedback in this video. So we can, yeah, see if this is a method that can be used on 14th gen, because I think that would be quite interesting. Okay, thanks for tuning in and see you next time. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday, bye.